Well, good morning to Midday Connection on April 13th here at First Presbyterian Church. I'm Pastor Joel. I'm David Welch. And we're going to uh, read through the daily lectionary passages for today and talk about them a little bit and see how uh, the Lord is going to meet us through the reading and hearing of his word. Let me open this in a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, we are grateful to you for providing us the opportunity to read your word and the promise that your spirit speaks to us through your word. So I pray, Lord, that today uh, as we read and as we listen and as we discuss that you will be glorified in all that we do and say and that we would be changed uh, increasingly into the people that you would have us to be, uh, those who have been transformed into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. So we thank you for this opportunity, and we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Starting this morning with our uh, ordinary uh, Laudate Psalms, um, Psalm 5 and then 147, 1 through 11, um, they tend to be psalms that are regularly done. Uh, these are the morning psalms of the daily lectionary, and so these are ones that as uh, as people participate in the morning offices of certain traditions, uh, the, the regular repetition of these things help them to sink more deeply into our hearts. And so while, uh, while um, maybe sometimes um, we might have a tendency of wanting to do something new or go on to other things, I think there's, there's a way that we are being regularly transformed by the reading of certain psalms in particular. Uh, as, as, as God in his wisdom knows that we are creatures of habit. Uh, we are people that need variety, but we are also people that need constancy. And so while we do these psalms regularly, it is important for us to continue to do so. So starting out with Psalm 5 today. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Give heed to my sighing. Listen to the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for to you I pray. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I plead my case to you and watch. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil will not sojourn with you. The boastful will not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in awe of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. For there is no truth in their mouths. Their hearts are destruction. Their throats are open graves. They flatter with their tongues. Make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Because of their many transgressions, cast them out, for they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them so that those who love your name may exalt in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover them with favor as with a shield. Our second psalm is Psalm 147, verses 1 through 11. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. For he is gracious, and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord, and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds, prepares rain for the earth, makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the animals their food and to the young ravens when they cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the speed of a runner. 
but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in whose hope, in those who hope in his steadfast love. Our Hebrew scripture reading today comes from Lamentation chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. How the Lord in his anger has humiliated his daughter Zion. He has thrown down from heaven to earth the splendor of Israel. He has not remembered his footstool in the day of his anger. The Lord has destroyed without mercy all the dwellings of Jacob. In his wrath, he has broken down the strongholds of daughter Judah. He has brought down to the ground in dishonor the kingdom and its rulers. He has cut down in fierce anger all the might of Israel. He has withdrawn his right hand from them in the face of the enemy. He has burned like a flaming fire in Jacob, consuming all around. He has bent his bow like an enemy, with his right hand set like a foe. He has killed all in whom we took pride in the tent of daughter Zion. He has poured out his fury like fire. The Lord has become like an enemy. He has destroyed Israel. He has destroyed all its palaces, laid in ruins its strongholds, and multiplied in daughter Judah mourning and lamentation. He has broken down his booth like a garden. He has destroyed his tabernacle. The Lord has abolished in Zion festival and Sabbath, and in his fierce indignation has spurned a king and priest. The Lord has scorned his altar, disowned his sanctuary. He has delivered into the hand of the enemy the walls of her palaces, a clamor was raised in the house of the Lord, as on the day of festival. The Lord determined to lay in ruins the wall of daughter Zion. He stretched the line. He did not withhold his hand from destroying. He caused rampart and wall to lament. They languished together. Her gates have sunk into the ground. He has ruined and broken her, broken her bars. Her king and princes are among the nations. Guidance is no more, and her prophets obtain no vision from the Lord. Our New Testament reading is 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23 through chapter 2, verse 11. But I call on God as witness against me. It was to spare you that I did not come again to Corinth. I do not mean to imply that we lord it over your faith. Rather, we are workers with you for your joy, because you stand firm in the faith. So I made up my mind not to make you another painful visit. For if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one whom I have pained? And I wrote as I did, so that when I came I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice. For I am confident about all of you, that my joy would be the joy of all of you. For I wrote you out of much distress, and anguish of heart, and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know of the abundant love that I have for you. But if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but to some extent, not to exaggerate it, to all of you. This punishment by the majority is enough for such a person. So now, instead, you should forgive and console him, so that he may not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. I wrote for this reason, to test you and to know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. What I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ. And we do this so that we may not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. Our Gospel reading today is from Mark 12, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus began to speak to them in parables. 
A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the season came, he sent a slave to the tenants to collect from them his share of the produce of the vineyard. But they seized him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And again, he sent another slave to them. This one they beat over the head and insulted. Then he sent another, and that one they killed. And so it was with many others. Some they beat, and others they killed. He still had one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Our third psalm is Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, that will I seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger, you who have been my help. Do not cast me off. Do not forsake me, O God, of my salvation. If my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Do not give me up to the will of my adversaries. For false witnesses have risen against me, and they are breathing out violence. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. And our final psalm is Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner, when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. 
Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. A sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, these last couple days, um, Natalie and I have been talking. Uh, David has a chance uh, for us to talk together, and I'm excited about this opportunity. Uh, having read the last few days from Lamentations, not a book that we typically like to spend much time in at all because of the difficulty of uh, these descriptions of how God has uh, destroyed the city of Jerusalem. Um, and I am, whenever I read Lamentations, I'm challenged by it, and I think about how uh, the Psalms that we read, um, especially say Psalm 51, was written prior to Lamentations, written from uh, King David's um, need to repent, uh, his, his uh, the great sin that he had committed with Bathsheba and killing Uriah, um, and the, the consequences that God said were going to come upon David, and how David writes Psalm 51 and cries out for forgiveness. It's a, it's a psalm that we still sing today uh, as we reflect upon the, um, the, the residual unrighteousness, I guess, that still exists in our lives. Um, but how, how can you get from a place of Psalm 51 where there is confession, where there is repentance, where there's a, a recognition of the need for God's spirit to be present with the leadership of, of, of Israel, of Jerusalem in particular? How do you get from there to Lamentations? How do you get to this place where clearly the people that were called by God are not doing those things that are exhibited in Psalm 51. They're, they're not repentant. They are regularly wicked. They seem to exalt in their sins. Um, and then Lamentations, uh, the destruction of the city, the, uh, the, the um, description of God being seen as an enemy of the people and drawing his bow uh, to kill as opposed to uh, in in Noah's time, putting his bow in the clouds as a, as a symbol of no longer having enmity against the people. Here is this, um, uh, uh, a God who is executing his justice upon the people. And, and it's, a, it's a difficult passage. It's, it's, it's tough. It's tough to go into, especially when you combine it with Mark, where here is Jesus himself reminding the people of Isaiah's prophecy, you know, the whole image of a vineyard and God establishing a vineyard and, and the people in the vineyard not being obedient to what God has commanded of them, um, beating the prophets and killing the prophets and ultimately killing the Son of God who came to uh, exercise and demonstrate God's authority over all things. And it's just a challenging passage to me um, as, as, as I know that I do not live a perfect life. Um, and, and I think about the ways that our own country um, is not a perfect country and how there are many difficulties that we face and how people are complaining, well, you know, why do all these bad things continue to happen? And I just think that there is a huge disconnect between the heart of repentance from Psalm 51 that we read and then our ordinary 
behavior uh, in disobedience to what God's called us to do. It's, it's just challenging to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, one of the things we learned from Lamentations and and also from the Mark parable about the unfaithful tenants in the Lord's vineyard is that uh, we do worship a God who takes sin seriously. Um, that's not something we reflect on all the time uh, because it makes us uncomfortable. Uh, our, our instinct is to write off our sin or justify uh, what we've done or um, to think to ourselves that it really wasn't that bad. But God doesn't treat sin that way. Uh, he takes it very seriously. Um, even even in, in both Lamentations and in the parable of the vineyard, you see God's, God's wrath coming upon his chosen people because they because of their unfaithfulness because of their opposition to his purposes and to his will uh, because of um, their disobedience to his commandments uh, over and over you see that in both old and new testament um, that god does avenge wrongdoing and that's the whole reason for this week and for the for the cross that uh that God's wrath is serious. Um, that sin is serious. Uh, it is. Uh, it is. It is a perversion of what God intended. It's a. It's a falling short of what God intended. It's. It's. Um, it, it is. Uh, sin demands the shedding of blood uh, to bring about reconciliation. Uh, we see that principle in the new in the old testament law thanks be to god that he sent his son jesus to shed his blood so that we could be reconciled to him it's a very very serious thing um, if it weren't serious god wouldn't have had to send his son and jesus wouldn't have had to die but he did um, thanks be to god Amen. for that sacrifice um, I, I see that playing out in the second Corinthians passage, which obviously is taking place after the death of Jesus, after his resurrection, where uh, after Paul's conversion, where, where Paul himself had been a persecutor of the church and had been so caught up in his cultural understanding of, of faith and his religious duties and his dedication to God, but how it was it, the, the, the severity was there, but the, but the, the absence of grace, I think, was, was uh, what, what Paul needed to have kind of shown to him and explained to him. Mm -hmm. And so even in the Second Corinthians passage, we don't know um, specifically what, uh, uh, what Paul is, is referencing here, but we have indications from 1 Corinthians that, that Paul had uh, learned of sin in the Corinthians community, uh, some some egregious uh, sin, and Paul had commanded the church to put somebody out from that church, lest that sin infect the larger body. That the, that the church, even as they could celebrate um, the grace of God and the forgiveness of God and uh, the fellowship with God. How, how sin still has the capacity to, to destroy uh, or s at least severely wound a community of faith uh, and needs to be dealt with um, pretty severely. And so for Paul to, to command someone to be put out of a congregation in order really to protect um, the community as a whole, but, but also then to challenge that person who had been committing that sin of the severity of their own wickedness. And here in 2 Corinthians, it seems that, that the grace uh, and the, the forgiveness um, is always going to be stronger than, than the sin. And I think that's one of the fascinating things about faith in Christ. Uh, one of the most uh, amazing things about grace in Christ 
Um, there is nothing that we can do that would be in, in, a, in a sinful capacity. There's no sin that we could commit that is beyond Christ's capacity to cover with his own blood, um, to, uh, to, to, to nail it to the cross, to put it into the grave, to kill the sin. Uh, so that we might then have have new life, um, and I think this is where uh, we as Christians, especially in, in the church today, where uh, we know that we are dealing with 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 all of us, ourselves included, that still have sin issues in our lives that that we're uh, that we are battling against, uh, but but people still have sin in their lives, um, no matter how good we try to dress it up on Sunday morning. Or how, or how well we try to disguise it by not really interacting with each other frequently during the week. You know, we can hide our sins pretty well. Um, we can cover them up. We can think like you were saying earlier. Well, maybe it's just it's not that bad. You know, my, yeah, I know it was wrong, but it wasn't. You know, it doesn't rise to some impressive level that needs you know real discipline. Um, but we're dealing with people in the church all the time uh, that have issues that if left untreated will ultimately lead to death. I think that's what we learn from Lamentation. It's they were given opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to repent when, when, when Jeremiah was preaching to them God's word, and they didn't. They, they in fact kicked, kicked Jeremiah out, tried to kill Jeremiah, abused him, uh, the guy who was bringing an opportunity for repentance, and, and they didn't take it. Um, how true is that in our church today? How can we uh, learn to, um, as, as leaders in the church, learn to um, love people so much that, that sin becomes um, uh, the, the necessity to, to deal with it becomes uh, so important and paramount. Uh, but here again, uh, in 2 Corinthians, Paul is saying, at, at some point, you know, the forgiveness and the grace and the, and the, and the mercy that, that combined with justice is always meant for reconciliation, is always meant to draw people back to Christ. Um, and so again, uh, God's severity that he poured out on Jesus at the cross was based upon the fact that he loved us so much that he wanted to, he, he dealt with our sin. Uh, he dealt with the severity of our sin uh, in a very severe way, uh, all all because of love, so that we can then be reconciled to Him. That's yeah, just it's such a such a great reality. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah, and I I think um, it's important to remember that even even the punishment that God uh, that God. Um, he meets out to sin uh, and to, to those who are unrepentant is actually a punishment that comes out of a heart of love just like the punishment of a father um, comes out of love for his son right because the ultimate will of God is that all people would be reconciled to him and so he makes it <laughs> He, he has created a world in which there are consequences uh, for our choices, in which we do reap what we sow, uh, because that's the only way that we'll, uh, sometimes, uh, that's a, that's a, that discipline is the only way that we come to appreciate the, the, the depth of our need for him and the severity of our, of our sin and the ways in which we've transgressed his his law, but his will is for is, is to forgive and to bring about repentance and reconciliation, and uh, and sending his son to us, I think, proves that that is God's heart, even when He is punishing uh, punishing sin. Yeah. Well, um, thanks for engaging in this conversation with me. I, I appreciate your insights into into God's word. Uh, and I think as we as we go to close in prayer, uh, I just want to remind everyone who's listening or watching uh, to to read read God's word on your own and trust that God's Holy Spirit can reveal to you uh, 
what your immediate response could be. You know, I'm grateful that David and I have a chance to talk together, uh, but please know that I, we strongly believe that God, through his spirit, uh, reveals truth to everybody who humbly seeks. Uh, Jesus promises that if you seek, you will find, because God wants to reveal himself uh, to you. God wants to give the grace um, that is that he that he paid for, you know, that he accomplished on the cross, and so um, you know, just being reminded of Psalm five, how the, the psalmist himself um, writes about uh, crying out to God in the midst of the struggles, recognizes the evil all around him, uh, but trusts that uh, that God ultimately provides uh, for those who who hold fast to God's promises. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Well, Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time, for this day, uh, for again the opportunity to read your word and to be transformed by it. Lord, I'm grateful that your word is challenging, um, that your word um, confronts, uh, confronts us in a way that forces us to, uh, to think and to pray and to cry out to you more regularly. Uh, Lord, there are still elements in, in my life that, that need your healing touch. There are ways that, that I uh, continue to fall short. And so I'm grateful, Lord, that each and every day you confront me uh, with my need for you ultimately. And so Lord, uh, uh, help all of us to, to, to cry out to you. Help all of us to, uh, to read more of your, of your promises, to read more about your life in Jesus Christ. Uh, to read more about how the church um, experienced the, the difficulties of, of living in a new way uh, that's contrary to uh, the way the world has, has twisted things and fallen short, a, a new way of, of obedience and ultimately in, with the new life that you are bringing. Uh, Lord, help us to, um, to see these things, to read these things, to hear these things, and ultimately to live these things that uh, one day we will experience you face to face and rejoice in the, the ultimate re uh, reconciliation of, re of relationship that you made possible through your son, Jesus Christ. So we thank you and we praise you for this day. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody. Uh, I certainly hope that you would, as you listen, hit like and subscribe on YouTube. Uh, tune back in as we continue to go forward. And um, we're trying to figure out the comment section on YouTube, trying to figure out how you could get that turned on. But uh, please do call the church, uh, First Presbyterian Church of San Angelo, if you'd like to talk with me or talk with David or others. And we'd certainly be happy to listen to you and then to pray with you. Uh, we're looking forward to our um, Good Friday service here in the sanctuary at 515 on this Friday um, here in the sanctuary. And then Sunday morning, uh, the service out of the Lake Lodge at uh, 630 and then here in the